All right, folks, just uh, out for a walk. Gone up to St. Paul's, not been up here for a while. Been going out on my bike quite a lot lately. You know, weather's been pretty good, so I've been going out on my big bike. I've not been doing much walking, and I like walking, so walking's good. Hippocrates, the, the, the father of all the doctors, or the grandfather, the ancient Greek, uh, the Hippocratic Oath that all doctors should take, which is that you will preserve human life above everything else that you do. That's what every doctor should do. But we all know that they don't throughout history. They haven't always done that, have they? But we won't go into that, will we? No. The Hippocratic Oath. You a hypocrite. No, what does Hippocrates Maybe that's why they call it the hypoc hypocrite. <laughs> I don't know, I'd have to look it up. What does it mean? Words and their meanings. Yeah, Hippocrates said, walking is the best medicine, if you can. Not everyone can walk. Not everyone can talk. If you can, talk. If you can walk, walk. <laughs> Shop's only around corner, get in car. No, Hippocrates said walk. How far is it? Walking's good for you. Good for your metabolism. Yeah? It's just good. Walking's good. Running's good. Jogging's good. But walking's good as well. Walk far. Some people in the olden times used to walk miles and miles every day. They had to because there were no cars. And even if there were cars, maybe they would have listened to Hippocrates because he was a doctor. Yeah? Um, yeah, just uh, out for a walk and it's nice to come up to St Paul's, not been up here for a while. There's the stumps here, everything's pretty much the same. It's that time in midsummer or this time of summer when everything just sort of looks a bit dead. Well, it's not dead, but the green is so startling, so it's not so impressive. As a few weeks ago these things what my mate John said is an evasive species is it but it's all right bring them bring bring forth come forth and multiply but it's all right by me uh, so Jesus my Lord and Savior he had a lot of things to say about a lot of things some people, his critics are like, he's got an answer for everything. Well, he's God, so yeah, he said he was God. So he better have an answer for all the big things, right? What I'm finding is, he kind of does have an answer for everything. He didn't really say jack shit about politics. You know, I always think about that. Just hypothetically, if, if you, even if you don't believe in God, just try to imagine if God did exist, and if he did come down, what would, what, what, what do you think he would say? What would be the kind of things that he would say, or she, or it? What, what would be the kind of things that he'd want to hear? Which political party to vote for? Whether to take the vaccines? Whether to have buy a Netflix, Netflix subscription? Pornhub or um, what's that other one? I don't know. There's a lot of different. Which when you <laughs> try too many choices, what would you be asking him? Well, JC, he didn't really bother talking about stuff like that. And a lot of the stuff that he did say, some people say it's a little bit. Oh look, somebody's getting married here. Someone's getting married. Oh. Walk around. Someone's getting married. One person's born, another person dies, and another person gets married, another person gets divorced. <laughs> you shouldn't do that, but people do. Yeah, uh, you'd, you'd be like, well, what do you expect him to say? He speaks in parables mainly, and, and he uses allegory and metaphor and things like that. So over 
the centuries, over 2,000 years since he was here, loads of people have been like, well, what does he mean by this? Is he speaking literally? Or is he speaking, like, what does he mean? That's the whole idea. And his followers, or the apostles, actually asked him, they said, Lord, Rabbi, why do you speak to the majority of people in parables? And he said, because, well, he explains why. Look it up. He says, I, things have been revealed to you. You already know that I'm God. Because you just do. I mean, most of them abandoned everything to follow him. Peter, who was known as Simon, was a fisherman. Him and the other two, the sons of Zebedee, I think that's right, uh, John and uh, the other one, they abandoned everything. To, they literally dropped what they were doing and they didn't even go home to tell the mum and dad, they just left home. Some people left everything to follow him. It's true, histori you know, historically, it, the historical Jesus, the people who followed him, they abandoned everything. Their wives sometimes, their children, uh, they left home and their communities in order to follow him. And so to some of them, it's like, you get it. Right, so, some people in this world, the majority, me included, for a long time in my life, I could see something that is miraculous, right, a miracle, and I, and I would always just go, well, maybe it's because of this, maybe it's because of that, it doesn't matter, like Dostoevsky and all those great people said, God could come back right now in front of my face and I, I could see it and there will always be people who will just say oh well it's just this or it's just that um, there's always an explanation for it and we live in the age of the of scientific reason and all this lot it doesn't make no difference and Jesus knew that 2000 years ago there are some people in this world who it doesn't matter what you do or show them it doesn't make a blind bit of difference. There is, what, what do they call it? Confirmation bias or whatever. Human beings, are, some people are just hardwired to be like that. And no amount of evidence is ever going to persuade them one way or the other. If they've already said in their minds, God isn't real, then God isn't real. You know, it's just the way that it is. It's unfortunate, but it's just the way that it is. Jesus knew that. So, a lot of the times, he's just saying to people, he's, he's using, it, it tells, it tells, it, it tells it in a, in a story, or, or using like an allegory that somebody can put into practice in their life and see objective results. And then they can carry on with their lives doing this thing that is said to do this new way of doing things that maybe culturally is not acceptable or people would laugh at you for doing it or the authorities the religious authorities would say that you're not supposed to do it or whatever or the government is saying you're not supposed to do it he would say do it this way deal with this problem in this way and you will get a different you will get this result and I get it, I just do. For me, I just do. But I still do have that tendency to go, well, how can I put that into practice in my life? You know, like I'm waiting for a specific scenario to come along because he uses scenarios. One of his biggest ones is love love your enemy and love you love your neighbor and love your enemy because at the time uh, under the Jew, jewish um community that it was in the the it was the way that people live their lives was love your neighbor but hate your enemy 
anyone who persecutes you, we all, you know, all of us will have an enemy in our life. All of us should do, and Jesus even says that. He goes, if you haven't got enemies, there's something wrong with you. You know, you're probably hiding away. You've probably been deceitful, not telling people how you feel and things like that. You know, being a human being and having your own opinions, being able to express yourself, being able to, um, you know, function with other people, you are inevitably going to come across people who disagree with you and um, accidents happen, things happen, and, um, situations can be bad. And getting out there in the real world, unfortunately, you are going to come across. All of us are going to come across people who we just don't get along with. And it could be an individual, it could be a group of individuals, or it could be a society. <laughs> it could be an entire system, like a nation, a government, or an institution. You know, it's just inevitable it's going to happen. And so, because the, the way that the people were living at that time, that group of people that he came from, a very large group of people, um, they disagreed about certain things, but there were certain things that were absolutely, you know, written in stone. You know, like, this is the way that you do things. The Ten Commandments. And... Uh, the way that they interpreted what was given to Moses and Abraham and the prophets before was, okay, the way that we live our lives is, we obviously have to love our families and we um, love our neighbour, right? So maybe the person who physically lives next door to you, but it also, it doesn't just mean that. It means, like, if they were Jewish, a non-Jew, a person who was not Jewish, you have to love them near your neighbor you have to live by them you have to live side by side but with you know with them you know in a in a community or you know a few miles away but when it comes to enemy the word enemy it's someone who's persecuting you either physically or with some of the means that you're absolutely you're actually being persecuted and the law at the time never said anything about extending love to those people. It's very similar to, um, um, well, it, it, it's like harboring that hatred and resentment inside your heart. Actually fighting them, if you can do, getting together and fighting them physically. But then there's going to be times, you know, if you were to put it into context at that time when Jesus is around, um, the Roman Empire was uh, massive, it was just, it, it was huge, and the Roman um, Empire was extremely powerful. Uh, the, the, no, 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 there was no army on earth, really, that could beat the Roman, um, uh, Roman legions. They were militarily the most capable um, that there was, you know, in any part of the world that they went. I mean, they lost many battles, but they, they, ten they, they tended to win and they tended to keep the territorial gains and make sure that they could withhold, um, uphold their system. You know, no one could really infiltrate it. And so the Roman ideology and things was totally alien to that Judeo, Jew, Jewish way, that concept. I mean, they had uh, understanding of gods um, and God but as a more of an abstract concept and it was sort of debated as to what you know really god wanted god was sort of more distant in the eyes of the roman empire than it was in the jewish community the jewish community was centered around the belief and the the certainty that god existed and that god uh, god reveals what he wants for us what he wants for humanity and so they lived by a strict code. And they would, and they did, view the Roman Empire as an enemy. But militarily, they couldn't stand a chance. That part of, like, Palestine, that, that, that area in the world, what we call modern-day Israel today, 
um, Judea and all the all the ten tribes and everything that were around that area, they wouldn't have stood a chance against the Romans on a on a on a guns up kinetic fight. So that doesn't just because they couldn't beat them on the battlefield didn't mean that they weren't trying to beat them beat them in other ways. And it's just a fact they were they were sub they were there was subterfuge there was um, they were constantly trying to undermine Roman um, authority and autonomy they were trying to break away they were rioting all the time and it was a massive thorn in the side for the Roman Empire because they were living by that they are they're not like us yes they are our neighbor but they're persecuting us which they were they were stealing land they were treating the Jews like like shit and so they hated them and they stored all of their hatred in their hearts. That's the world that Jesus was brought up in. This thing about every single person in the street, everyone in the synagogue, all the, all the rabbis, everyone, you are trained to harbor the hatred for the Roman authorities. Some people were actively working with them, but in their hearts, they hated them. And there's all kinds of, um, you know, things that you could go into about what, what that actually does to people, harbouring hatred in your hearts. Um, I mean, we know this with modern science now, that if you are just a person who's filled with hatred, and I know this from my life, it will destroy you. It distorts your body. It, you know, it makes you, like, angry. It actually physically changes you. It makes you have all kinds of problems. Usually it uh, goes into your gut. So you've got problems with your guts because it's harboring this dark, toxic energy. And it's, <laughs> like Jesus said, it's demonic. <laughs> Hatred is demonic. And it's bad. Even if you are justified, even if you feel, yeah, but I have to feel this way. It doesn't matter, Satan still wins <laughs> because you are actually physically destroying your body. It, it's just not good. A person can only live so long on hatred. And if a person can, then a family can, and then a society can, and eventually it's going to destroy the whole thing. A nation of people cannot survive harboring hatred inside them, just the same way that an individual can't, because it will fuck them up. It physically will fuck them up mentally and um, it'll cause all kinds of problems in your relationships. Like, um, you know, Dave Cameron, his teaching were always about that, you know, effective relationships. If you're going around harboring this hatred and anger inside all the time, you, you're gonna, it's going to blind you. It actually makes you, like, gives you aspect blindness. And um, you, you're not going to be able to see who's your friend and uh, you, it's just going to totally fuck you up. And see, Jesus knew this stuff because he was God. He's saying it's not good to hate anyone. But then the, the, the big argument is, well, what are we supposed to do? Just give in to them. You know, give in to our enemies, give in to the Roman Empire, which are actually persecuting us. And this is the radical thing, and this is where... Jesus almost got himself into a lot of trouble in politics because it's almost as if he's saying, I'm not saying back down at all. I'm saying fight them, right? And, and they're like, what? How do you mean? It's what it is. It's spiritual warfare. And But as St. Paul, decades later, when he, he was the great sort of... Um, St. Paul was just amazing and St. Paul formulated the idea of how because the word Christians weren't really used at that point then they're just people who followed Jesus' teachings they were just people who followed called following the way or whatever St. Paul actually uses the analogy of a um a centurion, a soldier, and says, you see that soldier over there? We're going to be just like him. And they're like, well, you know, on a, 
in a materially sort of scientific way of looking at it, you go, well, what, you mean we're going to equip ourselves like him? And we're going to be a, a soldier who's going to fight him? He's saying, no, because we'll always lose. <laughs> the Roman Empire is too big. And I can't remember the verse off the top of my head. He says we're going to be dressed just the same as him. Helmet, um, breastplate, um, good walking shoe, a sword and a shield, armour and things like that. But they're going to be spiritual weapons. And essentially what it is, is using the ultimate gift that God has given mankind, which is love. But love as defined by what he said love is patient love is kind love is not proud love does not boast love does not envy love is not self-seeking love does not dishonor others love makes no record of past wrongs love does not delight in evil but rejoices in the truth love always protects love always hopes love always trusts and love always perseveres it's that and that's it and he's saying but we're going to use those which are sort of ideological uh, sort of um they're abstract concepts really but the things that you can put into practice in in, in anyone's life that it's gonna it's a idea that you can it's gonna change the way you respond to the environment and to people and it's going to have a, an effect, a positive effect that you can see. I mean, it, it goes on to say the seven virtues that any person... And at the time when Jesus was saying, when Jesus was doing his ministry, he did his ministry, the historians, are, they say it's either two and a half or three years. He was preaching for three years, and then he was led to his execution and killed. And before that, there's very little evidence of him. It was, everyone says, all of the sources say, it came from Galilee, a place called um, Nazareth, which was just a backwater, literally, it was just a backwater. If you're talking about Rome as, say, Washington, D.C., it'd be like, like I've said before, like coming from Chickenley, or somewhere just insignificant. And what was it? It was a carpenter. He was a literal nobody. He was a nobody for the first, um, well, so again, 28, 29 years old. That's when he met John the Baptist and he was baptized. And then that's when he um, started doing his ministry, saying that he was God. And that's when he started doing his preaching. Jesus said, Jesus said um, very little about um, very little about politics and things like that. Very little. He tried not to get involved or anything like that. He was just doing teachings to, to individual people. And I've lost my thread now. Hold on. Yeah, it's Saint Paul who comes up with the seven virtues of um, what a person. These are the seven greatest things. So he's already defined what love is in Corinthians um, 4. Corinthians 13 verse 4, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I've, I've done a video on about it loads of times. But the seven virtues that he says that all of us should try our hardest to aspire to and actually, you know, make sure that it affects, that, that it has a, an effect, you know, put them into practice. He says, chastity so you know don't go around shagging everyone you know keep it between you and your wife you know one man one woman who you love and um you know like you never say he said have loads of sex if you want but keep it with someone that is meaningful like one-on-one -on -one. and because remember in the roman world at the time they were having polygamy or orgies and, and stuff like that were commonplace and they say no that's no way to live it's not, it might be good for five minutes, it might be a lot of fun, but it's, it's not 
it's not the way that God wants it. It's just not. It's just not good. It's uh, it's it, it, it's actually poisonous. And there's been a lot of studies to suggest that that people who are um, um, promiscuous are very unhappy people. They are. It makes you happy. It's like a drug addiction. It makes you happy for a few minutes and then it makes you miserable. So chastity. Um, even when you're in a loving relationship with someone, you know, like these sex maniacs, you know, try to, you know, try to, um, try to limit it, you know, <laughs> I mean, like, uh, obviously if, if you, if your wife is on, on a period or whatever, you can't, you know, but <laughs> I don't know, I'm, I don't want to go into all that, but, you know, limit it, you know, have breaks from it, abstinence, so that you appreciate it when you do have it. You know, but it's chastity. You're not just fucking shagging all the time, right? And you're keeping it exclusive to someone who's, who, ca who you care about and who cares about you as well. And, then, and you might not be in that position at the moment, so just wait then. Do you know what I mean? Stop fucking wanking all the time. Do you know what I mean? And give it give it away, give it away, give it away, man. <laughs> that red up chili pepper sound. Anyway, not going to go into it, but that's what he says. And St. Paul had... Uh, a mandate from God to say this. Jesus picked him out because Jesus liked him. Chastity. Number two, temperance. Temperance. So I don't be getting pissed up and stunned all the time. So I like to get drunk now and again. So I like to take drugs now and again, if that's what you want to do. But don't do it all the time. I can. I've learned that lesson. I mean, it's been what? All, uh, all these years, I can't take drugs and I can't drink because I can't handle it. I don't like the way it, uh, I can't. It changes me. I'm an alcoholic. I, I can't drink and I don't like taking drugs. And now that I've had this thing, I don't see the point in doing it. You know because you know, I smoke weed, you know, a little bit, and uh, the way that I see the world now, it's literally like all the colours have come out and. Um, I see the world totally differently now and it's the way that I always wanted to because I'm not reliant on drugs. Now I used to sometimes when I smoked weed, I'd, I'd, oh, I didn't smoke weed, it was um, resin or whatever. I would sort of see that, but now I don't need to. You know, all the shit that went with it, feeling paranoid and all that lot. I don't feel like that now. So temperance, but it's also about many things. It's not just about about drugs and, and alcohol and things like that, it's about food. Don't be indulging in anything. You know, fast, don't be eating all the time because that can make you sluggish and it can make you, you know, tired. You want to be sharp and alert. God loves people who fast. You know, actually just having a break from things and um, not eating, not stuffing your face and being greedy. Do you know what I mean? So, temperance. And but temperance from loads of things, you know, from indulging, you know, in, in things. Don't indulge in anything. Appreciate things and don't don't this is what I'm learning to do, not not sort of take don't use life like a drug, you know, which I've been trying to work on. Like I say, I'll be doing this for the rest of my life, I will. I'll never hundred percent get it. Not on this fucking earth. But it's something worth trying. So temperance, chastity, temperance, charity, or the word is translated as love, as I've just said in Corinthians 13. Love is patient, love is kind, that one. Love does not envy, love does not boast, love is not self-seeking, love does not dishonor others, love makes no record of past wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. Love always protects, love always hopes, love always trusts, and love always perseveres. So, love. Just think about that. That's a virtue. Try to do it with everything. With the things that you... With material things, with everything that's in God's earth. And obviously, the main thing is... The reason why Jesus, God made himself into a man is because it's human beings who are going to fuck it all up. The animals are okay, <laughs> right? It's It's us. So it's our relationships with each other. Chastity, temperance, charity. So love, diligence. So diligence, we know what do you mean by that? Look it up, what does the word mean? 
it's translated from uh, the Latin or the Greek, whatever. Paul was, uh, could speak multiple languages. Diligence, what does it mean? Look it up. Be diligent. It means a lot of things. So, kind of been, in a way, like on guard. Diligent, you know, you're sort of prepared. You know, you're not just, you're not, you're not going to fall asleep at the wheel kind of thing. You're not going to... Um, you know, your head's not in the fucking clouds all the time. You're in the real world, you know, dil been diligent. So, saving for a rainy day, maybe, and all, all those things. You know, diligence, it means a, a lot of things. You know, it's one word, but it encompasses many different things. St. Paul, chastity, temperance, charity, or love, because that's what it means. Charity has been distorted over the centuries. What I, I, the word actually means, love as defined in what he says in Corinthians. Diligence, kindness. So kindness, I think we all know what that means. Sometimes it's very easy to be kind to your loved ones, you know, like your family, but it's very difficult to be kind to other people. It is, it can, it can get you in a lot. Of, it can get you in trouble because you're exposing yourself to it. But Jesus says, try just keep trying and i'll get to what he actually commands us to do so kindness kindness to strangers kindness to people just being kind patience so that goes without saying don't it be patient don't expect everything now be patient and then the last one is humility that is the most really the most important one jesus in his teachings time and time again is going on about humility all the time about being humble i love it there's one um, parable in luke which i really like and he says it in the house of a pharisee of one of the top uh, jewish people well, um one of the so he's a he's a he's a, he's a big shot and he invites Jesus round to his house with a big group of people. And um, I'm telling you, Jesus was not afraid of telling people straight to their faces. And that's why they hated him. Because he would just straight up tell them to their faces how hypocritical they were. He, uh, he sits down near the back. And this man who was invited him says, don't sit down there, come and sit down here. You know, basically like, sit up at the front, not down there with all the stinking fucking dossers. Sit up here at the top of the table. And Jesus rebukes him. And he says to us, to, to me who's listening 2,000 years later, or to anyone else, he says it on the Sermon of the Mount. When you get invited to a big shot's house, don't sit up at the front unless you're asked to. If no one's, you know, if they're busy or every, and everything like that, don't, don't just assume that you're going to be sat up at the front. Because what will happen is, you'll sit up at the front and another big shot will go, Hey buddy, you're in my seat, I'm sat up here. Um, so you'll have to get up and you'll look like a fool in front of everyone. Because it's all about, who sits at the top of the table is that thing about, it's all this game that the big shots play. Like, that's what Jesus is saying. That's what the big shots in the world are all striving for. Who sits at the top of the table? He says, we don't do that. We'll sit up there if they ask us to. But we'll sit at the... in, in the. Uh, we might not even sit at the table. You know, we might not. We don't even... We haven't, been, we haven't been told, have we? They haven't told us where to sit. So we'll just stand at the side. We'll eat our food at, uh, away from the table. And... That's what it's about. It's very hard to do. It's well, it's not that hard for me, but I, I kind of get it. I, I understand, but it's fucking hard for some people. He says because if you go up there and sit there at the top, you'll look like a fool, won't you? When the master says, uh, "Excuse me, no, uh, that's not where I meant you to sit. You can sit there." It's all in a row and an order, isn't it? But if you were to sit down in the stinking pleb area right and that, that's just you assume that's where you sit and then they come to you and say oh no you're not sitting here you're sitting up at the front with me you are raised up spiritually 
and and actually in the hierarchy, aren't you? He says, "He who humbles himself is raised to the highest, and he who raises himself to the highest is instantly brought down back to earth." That's the way that it is in the kingdom of heaven. That's what he says in the kingdom of heaven. He who humbles himself in all situations will find himself right at the top. Remember John the Baptist who baptised Jesus was, uh, um, didn't live in society, was a humble man. He came from um, sort of noble birth. His father was a, um, was a, um, a rabbi, a priest, so he probably came from a wealthy family. But he just gave it all away and he just lived in desert with a camel hair fucking coat and uh, a leather belt, living on locusts and honey, doing his ministry. He, and like Jesus said, he is the greatest man on this earth right now, John the Baptist. He was in prison when he said that. He was just about to get beheaded by um, Herod. And he said, he is the, the most humble, no, he's the greatest man on this earth, but he's the most humble and then how does jesus do it he goes but when you go into the next world he will be at the bottom <laughs> and, and he won't be crying about it either that's the way he'd want it because john the, the baptist despised all of those things like um you know it, it despised uh what's the word for it um showing off and stuff like i just despised it and he said, that's the way that it will be. That's the kingdom of heaven. It's heaven on this earth. In order that, that we're going to see it for, for the real thing when we die. But while we're here on earth, we can just try to make it like that. And Jesus is trying to just drill it into us that humility in all things that you do is the most important thing. Always be humble. Always. And it's very hard to do. Like he says, most people will try all their lives and they'll come close, but they'll never, no one will ever really be able to do it. But it's about trying. So they're the seven virtues. And like I said, it's all well and good. And it's all easy when it's, say, your family. It goes without saying that you're going to be like that with your child, aren't you? And your mother or your sister or your brother or your um, mother but we all know how hard it is to do that in a family it's almost impossible sometimes sometimes it's impossible to love your brother or your sister or your children you know when your children get older you know what happens you might have to disown them you might have big fallouts you might have to do that with your parents. What happens if you've got parents who are evil? Jesus says it might be the case that it's impossible to do that even in your own house, even in your own family. We see families break up all the time, don't we? So it, it kind of goes without saying that in a family, that is what you should try and do in a relationship. But it's radical, it's doing that with yourself. We've got to do all those things, it gets. I found it almost impossible to do these things with myself. So I was doomed. But I'm starting to learn how to do it with myself. And then everything falls into place. The blocks all seem to fall. All of a sudden, it gets a uh, really bad internet connection. I don't know, it might go off. Uh, yeah, it's hard enough to do it um, with, with a family, do you know what I mean? But he's saying you've got to keep trying. And then, some, I mean, sometimes you might just have to, you, you, you might just be abandoned from your family, do you know what I mean? Remember, Jesus does say that. He says that I come to, in a way, destroy families. You know, it'll be that way. You know, we can see this. This is one thing that um, David Wood uh, has said because he works with uh, Muslims. His best friend, Nabil Koresh, was a Muslim. And he says, I saw firsthand how how radical a thing it was for him to convert to Christianity because he lost he was ostracized from his entire family you know the the price of me turning around and saying I'm a Christian you know my mum's like I'm like mum I'm a Christian she's like 
good for you, love. You know, we live in a, we might not, but many people are like, oh, good for you. They're not really bothered about that stuff. Like David Woody converted when he was in prison and he said, no one really cared. You know, Randy, who was his um, bunk mate, who was the Christian, Randy just went, good for you, David. You know, God bless you. you know, he wasn't really that bothered. And most of the other prisoners, they could care less. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It wasn't, and then he rang his mum or whatever and his mum's like, you know, I just want to know that you're eating well and all that. Well, I'm not really bothered. You know, no one cared. But for a Muslim to convert to Christianity, not all the time, but the majority of the time, they will be ostracised from their family. Nabil's parents never spoke to him. He had countless death threats, death threats, you know, lost all of his friends that he'd grown up with and everything like that. It's a big fucking deal. And in the world that Jesus lived in at that time, it would have been exactly the same thing. If people were a strict sort of orthodox Jewish family and they heard that you were following Jesus, this guy called Jesus, your parents would never speak to you again. And they might even, you know, fucking stone you to death if they, if they got the chance. It's a radical thing. Jesus says that. I do not come to bring peace. Unfortunately, I don't. He says, I come to bring the sword. The sword will be raised in, um, in, in opposition to what I say. There will be nation turning on nation. There will be massive problems in families and everything. Even amongst the inside people, like St. Paul, you know, it almost killed him. Like physically, he was stunned for three days when he realised this stuff. Some people thought that he was going to die. You know, it's a massive shock and trauma to the entire it, it, like for me it changed my entire world view everything just just sort of that I thought before just crumbled away and, it, and it's radical it is Jesus says father will turn against daughter daughter will turn against mother three people no, out of a family of five, three will turn against two and two will be against three. You know, it's going to be a big deal because it's, um, it's going to be the hardest thing that people will ever do. Unfortunately, it should. In theory, it should bring peace, but it doesn't. It doesn't. And so what he's saying... That's a radical thing. Love your enemy. Because at the time when he said it, it were like, just went without saying that you don't do it. And it kind of, it kind of goes without, it's counterintuitive. It doesn't, it's not like that. If someone is persecuting you, you, you persecute them. <laughs> you know, you fight back. And it's difficult. I'm still trying to work out and people have debated. Would it be that you didn't physically fight back if someone starts beating you up? I'm sorry, if someone comes up to me right now and starts beating me up, I'm going to fucking fight back, right? I just will, because I'm not a... It's fight or flight. I'm a fighter. I'll stick up for myself. If, if someone's here with me, I will stick up for them if they're my friend. But that goes without saying, doesn't it? And it's in the, in the end, it's reflected in law. It's self-defence. And what's the chances of it happening? You know, probably not going to. He, he didn't really have much to say about that. He's just saying, under no circumstances will I or any of his followers ever be that person who is mugging someone or, you know, causing violence to another person in the first, if you know what I mean going around and behaving like that. In response to that aggression, I will fight back, do you know? But it's it's about who starts it, isn't it? And then it's all about, are you subconsciously walking around looking for that? Well, there's something wrong with you. And there would be something wrong with me if I were doing that as well. If I'm following these teachings, it should never happen, really. But we live in a fucked up world, crazy world, it might happen. So he's not really talking about that. And it goes without saying that um, you must protect the ones that you love. I will die for the ones that I love. And, uh, you know, I care about myself now. So if someone starts doing that to me, I'm going to, and if they're going to fight, I'm going to fight back. But, ow. 
he comes up with a solution that's kind of it was radical for the time and it might not be that radical for some people but it's quite radical for me and I, I, I see that in some situations I can't think of specific ones but I have actually done this before in my life and I, like I say I always know that Jesus has been looking out for me I always know that he has I just do now I know now that he's always been looking after me well the angels have always been looking after me because I have done this before what he says is in the book of Matthew in uh, chapter 5 he, he gives uh, three specific scenarios like uh, I say in parables that people at that time could understand and I think for me I'm not sure about anyone else when I first heard about those parables it's where I'd heard them from it comes from people like Monty Python and comedians and it's not really their fault but it's basically post enlightenment and it's people who have tried in academia and in, in the intelligentsia and in the curriculum and in society in general they've tried their hardest and they've done a damn good job on it is to make Jesus out to be someone that he wasn't and, f and for his teachings to mean something that they don't it's been it's it's not that the it, what it is Satan's greatest enemy is Jesus and Satan is extremely smart and extremely cunning and one of the ways that he's been able to, to do it is to like the ancient Chinese um, Sun Tzu, the guy who um, wrote The Art of War, the ancient Chinese knew this 5,000 years ago, where you might be in a position where you can't beat the person um, kinetic guns up warfare. So you have to do it through... Um, you have to... Uh, you have to, well, death by a thousand cuts, and you have to ridicule the person. You have to, you have to, like, um, paint him out to be something that he's not, in order that you can take him down. And that's what that has happened to um, Christ over the last couple of hundred years, mainly in the West. It has, in America and in the Europe, the European philosophers trying to make him out to be. Like I say, Jesus Christ Superstar, Jason Donovan, with his technical dream coat, you know, sandal wearing, peace loving guy who, you know, um, probably, I don't know, like a hippie or something, and, you know, like a multicolored hair and smokes his dooby dooby doos and he's a peace and love. That's not, the, that's not the historical Jesus, it's not. And it's been very effective. What he says, three things, when he's talking about love your enemy, chapter 5 is really about that, because he says it on the Sermon on the Mount, but he goes into details about how you will go about doing it. He says, there's three scenarios that he gives, that, and, and, it's, and it's about being able to put it into the our last uh, connection again. Is it the trees? Yes, probably. Now I know why Bill Gates wants to cut all trees down. Yeah, check it out. I don't want to cut the trees down. I'll just wait. I'll do another video if it goes out. I'll just uh, chill out in it. Not bothered. Yeah. Um, three scenarios. And because he's speaking to the people at a certain time they would have known exactly what he meant and the significance of it whereas 2000 years later the world has sort of changed a little bit it might be hard for, it was hard for me to understand when he says turn your cheek he says in Matthew 5 hold on I've got it written down because I need to know this well Matthew 5 verse 43 to 44 it says love your enemy bless them that curse you do good to those that hate you 
pray for those that despise you and persecute you and we all know it goes without saying doesn't it that in this world it's going to be one of the hardest things to do it's going to be really hard but he says do it he says the scenario is the first one there's three scenarios the first one is when someone hits you across the face with the back of their right hand so it'll all look fucked up because of this video because it's backwards at that time it was customary in Roman Roman custom particularly for soldiers and people who were in the nobility and things like that because it was a totally like a caste system you had unbelievably wealthy you had obviously Caesar and all of the um, senators at the top and then you'd have the peasants at the bottom and it was customary from people at the top to treat other people who were of a lower social status than them in a certain way actually physically treat them in a different way and one of the things for it's for insubordination or for honestly minor infractions even looking at them in the eyes I don't think I'm, I'm just learning about this stuff now because it's fascinating the Roman world and the Roman world spans you know a few centuries you know this is sort of just before Pax Romana when Jesus was around you know at the height of the Roman Empire and um, this is just sort of it's way before it started to collapse it were it's probably it's most powerful so it was very stable and it was because it were oh look here there's a missing missing dog oh. anyone who's watching puppy with lead attached missing from Arverthorpe Meadows oh it's a puppy please check bushes and shrubs if you're in the area do not call do not chase her because it'll be scared ring the numbers on the poster with time location and direction of travel yeah I'm going to take a photo of this and I'll uh, post it Oh, there's all these numbers here, look. Oh, so, uh, yeah. I've thought my dad searched around here. When did it go missing? I don't know. I'll take a photo of it and put it on Facebook. Because that must be harsh for them. Um, yeah, so the Roman... Well... Uh, this is the way that you would be treated, right? For, uh, I believe that it were even eye contact. You know, certainly manners. You spoke to them a certain way. And if you were... I mean, look, it's well documented that at that time the Jewish community were treated like shit. They were. The, the Ro Romans would have had very little fucking... Um, you know, like... Uh, they would have had no reason to do it because there were no laws for it. They, you know, and one of the things would have been that they, if you so insubordination or bad manners or um, been rude or whatever, they'd smack you really hard uh, at the back with the back of the right hand. And if you even raised your hand to one of them, you would be fucking killed. They'd make an example of you. You know, talk about not just throwing you in jail. You'd be, they'd fucking crucify you. You know, literally <laughs> crucify you. If you raised your hand to a Roman soldier or any of the, I mean, any of the nobility or anything like that, even a Roman citizen. Remember, St. Paul, the, one of the reasons why a lot of critics, the critics of St. Paul, which through the centuries there's been many of them, is that St. Paul was a Roman citizen. He had dual citizenship, and uh, he had certain rights, do you know what I mean? And he knew his fucking rights, he did, because he, he, he was a clever guy. He was from the nobility, like I said last week, they reckon he's from the Herodian family. So Herod, the king who uh, ordered all of the children to be killed when the census was taken, because he wanted... Bad connection. He wanted to make sure that the, um, he didn't know who Jesus was, but he wanted to make sure that that child would have been killed. He comes from that family. 
<laughs> Saint Paul, man, he's awesome. I love him. I that's why I know it must be. It is true. It is true. How it radically changes people's lives. But St. Paul knew the system, right? He was one of them. He was a smart guy. And like he famously said, I come to win. I'm a winner. I'm not someone who punches the air. You know, one of these fake, you know, punching the air. Because I'm not here to punch the air. I'm here to win. And I'll go as far as it as I need to go to win. And it cost him his life in the end. But he's like, no, I'm going to win. We're going to win. We're not here to punch the air. He knew. And remember who Paul was, Saul of Tarsus. He would have been one of those people who if you'd have even looked at him wrong or laughed at him or cursed at him or, you know, um, treat him with bad manners, he would have, he could have, and he did. Because what was he doing to the early Christians? He was persecuting them. He was arresting them, interrogating them. Dragging them out of their houses, murdering them. He, he, he personally murdered Saint Stephen in the temple. He killed Saint Stephen, killed him, stoned him to death. Him and the other rabbis, they, they threw the first. He was the one who threw the first stone at Stephen's head. You know, and it's like when you look at Hitler, you say, Hitler didn't physically kill anyone. But he's responsible for the death of millions of people. It's like that. He was, he was responsible for the death of thousands of people. But what well, we don't know. But it's hundreds and hundreds. It's a lot of people. And uh, he, in his mind, being the person that he was, being the man that he was, he was justified in doing it. And he had a mandate from Rome to do it. They wanted rid of these Christians as well. So the, he was paid well for it. And he was thought well of by everyone. From right to the very top. Right up to Caesar himself. And one of the ways of punishment that Jesus is using in this parable is. He's talking about that scenario. He says when a person hits you across the face with the back of his right hand that is the way this he says turn the other cheek so that he can hit you with the inside of his palm now it were customary to hit someone with the back of your hand because obviously it hurts more well does it yeah probably probably does but it was like a thing they saw you was filth they didn't want to get the inside of the palm dirty because they eat with it it's the back of the hand. They think so little of you that when they smash you across the face, they're doing it so that they don't dirty the hands. They just get the damage the back of the hands. That's how little they think of you. And so Jesus says, when they do that to you, turn the other cheek as if to say to them, hit me with the inside of your hand, please. And if they do that, the tree... You have forced them into a situation where they have to treat you like an equal. It's not about liking it. What Jesus is saying is, these people, this system, is trying to grind out of you your humanity. So what you must do is hold on to your humanity. Humanity is those things that I've said. The seven virtues and love, living to love and not to hate. That makes you a human being. That, differenti that differentiates you against the animal kingdom. It separates you from the animals. If you can love, you, 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 the paragon, you, you are like one of the supreme animals. You know, animals will even look up to you. If you can love animals, you know, like look at this dog here. You know, human beings love this creature and they will go to any lengths to find it. Do you think that the, you know, the tables are turned? I mean, a dog will try and find its owner, but dogs in general? You know, the, it, that dog's just terrifying. I and mean, it's us, we are, we can do amazing things if we follow a certain code. If we don't... Like Jesus says, the whole world will crumble and it will literally be destroyed. Literally. Look at what we've got now with nuclear weapons. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put a picture of that you know, and spread around. Let's hope that we can find this dog. I'll, I'll go for a long walk.
and I'm listening as well. You know, that's what it's about, love. Be this, the supreme creation. And what Jesus is saying is, there will be certain situations and scenarios where it's impossible, like, almost like they've tried to dehumanise you so much that almost you've got no humanity left. And the Roman Empire at that time had a pretty good system for doing that. They even classified you almost as non-human. You know, if you were a Roman citizen, you were theirs to do whatever the fuck they wanted to. Under certain situations, in certain scenarios. And so what Jesus is saying is, use your humanity as, their, as the ultimate weapon to show them that there's nothing that they can do to you that is going to take away your humanity. They will kill you. They might kill you. They crucified him, and that's, I think, why he had to be crucified in order for this to make sense. God had to make his son a person who was going to be persecuted. Otherwise, it would be total hypocrisy, wouldn't it, for him to say that you've got to do this and not actually do it himself. And he takes it to the extreme where he doesn't fight back. Jesus apparently never, ever fought back. He never raised his hand. He was a big man. The eyewitness accounts that I've been learning from the Romans who wrote back, the actual letters to the Caesar, um, two individuals who were prominent who met Jesus of Nazareth, and they said he was a big man. He was over six, he was uh, five foot, almost six feet tall, which was very big for that time, broad at the shoulders. He had a face that they said, um, he had piercing eyes and they said that he had a face that was like angelic but it also raised fear in you when you saw his face like uh, uh, some of the accounts say that when the, the, the soldiers who were beating him the ones that were drunk they some of them felt shame for doing it you felt like guilt for like hurting him because he, he was so, apparently a really pretty man he was a good looking man but he had sort of, uh, this guy um, who, who was the procurator after Pontius Pilate, he wrote a long letter, it's in the Vatican now, and one of them's in the Library of Congress in America. It says that he, uh, he, had, um, he had a strange sort of vibe about him, and he was not a pushover. He wasn't a little dweeb, do you know what I mean? He wasn't, he wasn't like this little weak, scrawny guy. He wasn't Jason Donovan in with his technical dream coat. He was a big man and he was... Um, he had a, a, an authoritarian... He had authority, commanded authority, even though he was from total, no, but like, fucking nothing. <laughs> because if you think about who he was, he was a carpenter from Nazareth. He would have been the lowest of the low. And there would have been no objective reason to treat him with any respect at all. But they did. Because he had a certain amount of dig dignity. People were afraid when he looked him in the eyes. People... He, he invoked feelings of compassion and feelings of fear. And that's what we're commanded to. All of his followers are commanded to be like Jesus. Make people want to... Be, be nice to you and be kind to you but make people fear you at the same time make make them know under no circumstances that you are a person who, to mess with and Jesus obviously never raised his hand to anyone but he had people who would die for him Stephen or Peter um, started fighting with the centurions and he um, cut one of them their ears off and it's Jesus who says to him he who lives by the sword, dies by the sword. Don't do that. He had men who were, and women as well who were literally willing to fucking die for him and fight, proper fighting as well. You know, Peter and the other guys, they were um, fishermen, you know, and they were probably from a very poor group in the Jewish community. They would have known how to fight with knives. They did know how to fight with knives. They knew how to use knives and they knew how to fight. And so they would. And some people even asked, uh, I think it's one of the apostles early on says to Jesus, you know, raise an army. You know, we could easily raise an army. You know, look at the followers that we've got in just a couple of months. You know, we could easily, you know, create like an army. And Jesus is all the time, no, 
we're not going to do that. He could have, if he wanted to, created an army of fighting men. And who, who could have, who knows, you know, they could have stood a chance against the Legion. They could have done. Look what the um, barbarians uh, did in, um, in Germany. You know, the tribes, it, was, it wasn't uncommon for um, a group of these, uh, what were deemed as savages, to be able to, uh, to beat them, you know, on certain ground. That Teutonberg Forest in northern Germany, that's one of the biggest massacres in the entire Roman Empire. You know, they wiped out, uh, legend has it, an entire legion. In, they, they, they sent them into a trap and um, killed every single one of them. And it's still there, Teutonberg Forest in the Nazi Empire. The Heinrich Himmler had all those massive stones put there. <laughs> he got all the slaves to do it. But, you know, you can go into that forest and see it to this day. You've got all those stones with all the runes on. And that's to commemorate when that army defeated um, that Roman legion. You know, it wasn't uncommon to do it. So Jesus could have easily done that. He could, Jesus could have been like what the Prophet Muhammad was to the Muslims, a military leader. He could have been, easily. That's what Muhammad was. Muhammad was a military leader. It was someone who was raising an army and fighting with weapons. Jesus didn't choose to do that, which is interesting, isn't it? If God made himself into a person, why didn't he make himself into a, the strongest army and the strongest fighter? He didn't, did he? So what does that tell us? It tells me a lot. That's not what God wants for us. And I, I get it, I do. So he, he, he uses that example. This three. He uses that example. When they hit you, across the face across the right cheek so hold on let me just think about this now if I hit someone with the back of my right hand it would be their right cheek he says turn your left cheek and let them hit you with that also and what it is it's psychological and it works it's forcing your persecutor like they say it actually works it, it's if if you force someone to say something twice or three times they say it um it forces you it's like a psychological trick it forces you to to reevaluate it subconsciously morgan freeman you know he's a brilliant actor and he says he never does more than three takes if a director asks him to do more than three takes, he knows that he's fucked up. Morgan Freeman, for his own discipline, says, if I can't do a scene in three takes, I'm shit. And I will have to do it another day, because I just can't do it. He says, there have been circumstances where I've been able to do it. Where I've been able to do something in more than three takes, but he says it's very rare. And it means that I haven't been prepared well, or the fucking director didn't know what he's doing. Morgan Freeman says that any project that he does, he would make sure that he trusts the director enough to know that all, all the shit's gonna be sorted out so I can nail this in at least, at most, three takes. You, Morgan Freeman, I don't know whether he's bragging, he says most of the stuff that he does is the first take, and I can believe it as well, because he's genuine. Morgan Freeman's a genius. Marlon Brando used to be like that as well, a couple of takes. Because what it is, if you repeat something that's supposed to be emotional more than once, the anger or whatever it is goes away and dissipates. And Jesus knew that because Jesus was God. If they hit you over the face once, it's in the moment of anger. But if you turn the other cheek and say, and you've got the strength and the balls, the balls to do it, the guts and the gumption to do it, and say, hey, hit me over the face again. This time hit me with that say it's a psychological thing and it makes them look at you a different way it makes them they might do it fucking hell they might drag you off to prison and they might crucify you and everything they might really go to town on you but it will force them in 
into a position that makes them look at you in a different way. It makes them look at you with fear because they know that you're stronger than them. If the tables were turned, would they be able to do it? The whole idea is that the whole world is going to be able to do this. So it, it, it will, will it, it's illogical, but it, it's kind of logical really that it will bring peace because no one's going to treat each other like that. But Jesus is God and he knows that it's just not. It's just not. People are too proud. Satan's too powerful. He's got too many cunning ways and the whole world is never going to be like this. So it's all about you, you, you trying to live in the world and you're always, always in every scenario, always trying to rise above. You're not lording it over people, but spiritually in a way you are. You're proving to them that you're better than them by if they behave like that to you you're proving to them you're you're using your actions the way that they're treating you you're proving to them in a spiritual way before the eyes of god because it might not work in before the eyes of men but before the eyes of god you're proving to them that you're better than them and yes they might have more money than you and yes they might be more powerful than you and you might have nothing you might be a homeless person on the street with nothing but you've got dignity and you've got your humanity the other scenario is um, in that scenario he says if somebody steals your cloak give it to them you know like they might have just taken it you know taken it off you he says give them your shirt as well and that's strange you know it's like well what does he mean by that well it, it makes sense because in that time if you were a homeless person well you don't have to be homeless but a tunic was uh, the item of clothing that was mainly worn you know people didn't have loads of clothes the majority of people didn't have it's not like today you know you might have a couple of pairs of clothes and that's it depending on how rich you are so if someone steals your coat your tunic it's a big deal it was worth a lot of money and it's actually in that part of the world or depending on what part of the world you lived in it was actually more than just a, a coat it was your sleeping bag it was your blanket to keep you warm so if somebody steals that from you that's a big fucking deal it's not a big deal now is it you know this is the, uh, what i'm understanding the world has changed now if someone nicks my coat it's not a big deal you know what I mean? I just buy another one or, you know, go to, you know, go to a charity shop or something. Or it's not a big deal. I mean, it's a big deal, but in those days, it was a big deal. You might freeze to death. So if someone steals your coat, that's a big deal. And what Jesus says to do, if they do that, while they're still there in front of you, take off your shirt, which is your undergarment, and say, here, buddy. You want my coat and you've just taken it? Take my fucking shirt as well. Because I will freeze to death tonight. You've taken off my tu you've taken my tunic, that's gonna keep me warm, and I've got my shirt underneath. Yeah, take my fucking shirt off and take that as well. And I'm definitely gonna freeze tonight. Yeah? Are you happy now? That's the mentality. Because it forces anyone else who's watching to look at that robber and look at him and go, You evil bastard. You greedy pig. Yeah, you've got a coat, but now look what you've done. You've made this guy potentially freeze to death. Again, Jesus is saying, force them to feel shame for what they've done. Force them to see you as a human being and have the guts to take that risk. Because like he's saying, you, you might die. You Well, he, he says you will die. Everyone dies. Every human being fucking dies. It's all about how you live. Your life. Your life is is um, is a tool that you can use. Your humanity is a tool. So if somebody steals your coat, you go, all right, are you fucking happy now? Yeah, he tell you what, here's my shirt as well, my fucking underpants. I have them. And I'll give you to them. I'll give you them as well. And they might walk away and you might freeze to death, but you've caused that person to sort of see himself, hopefully, if he's got a conscience, with shame. And anyone else who sees it, 
he'll never forget that in his life. Because if you were just a weakling who just went, oh, sir, yes, uh, here's, here's my shirt, oh, yeah, I'm so scared of you, then he's never going to remember it. He's just going to lord it over you. You know, uh, these people are often, like, predatory, like, animalistic. They can smell fear, so they'll never remember you. It's about spiritually and psychologically hiring yourself up above him and looking down on him and saying, hey, buddy, you might be able to physically take my coat from me, but my humanity is everything to me, and you've got no humanity. So you want your coat? Are you happy now? Yeah, there's the fucking shirt as well. And now look what you've done to me. So, again, you're spiritually rising above. I hate to say it in those terms, and uh, I hope I get this right. I think I have got it right. It's not designed to make people into pushovers and cowards and people who run away and throw their lives away. You might be being pushed over, but it doesn't mean that you have to be a pushover, if that makes sense. You might be being persecuted, but that doesn't mean that you have to be a persecuted person. Remember the story of um, Paul and Silas in the jail in Anatolia in modern day Turkey. They were in the jail. They weren't crying, were they? They were singing and everyone could hear them on the night in the, in the jail in the middle of the city, the hole in the ground. They were in that jail cell crying and, and worrying and, and they were singing. Keep yourself clean in all circumstances. Paul were um, very strict about that and the early Christians as well. In all scenarios, and this is actually something that they train soldiers to do. You know, soldiers who are in militaries. Even if you're in, they used to try and, they had a hard time doing it in the trenches in the First World War. But trench warfare that's going on now in Ukraine, one of the golden rules in all circumstances that they teach you to do. Always, at all opportunities, keep yourself clean. Clean yourself. Wash your face with cold water. Wash your genitals, you know, wash, uh, get the beer smell off you. Keep yourself clean and it gives you, like, it, it keeps you, um, it makes you, it gives you confidence. It, it makes you feel better. And that's what the early Christians used to do as well. You know, we don't go around stinking of beer. You know, what? have a wash. There's a river over there. We're going to have a wash. Wash at every opportunity. Keep yourself clean. You know, and it's actually true, it actually works. You know, when I were alcoholic, you know, I used to go days without having a bath and it's awful, it's awful. It's disgusting. It makes you feel disgusting. Having a bath or a, you know, a cold shower, splash yourself with cold water, it physically transforms you, it does. Just because you're in the trenches and it stinks and there's rats and there's dog shit and fucking human shit and blood and guts everywhere are all opportunities to try and keep clean and and it's actually a scientific thing that works that's why the military make you do it that's why your commanding officers will always make you be clean at all opportunities because it makes you a better fighter it makes you have more confidence it makes you feel better if you feel better you're gonna fight better you know it's just one of those things you know, it's very hard to do, might be impossible to do, but try to do it at every opportunity. My ex's um, mum said she never forgot at the end of the war when Germany surrendered. Her grandfather was fighting on the Eastern Front when she was a little girl. She was German. And she said one of the memories that she has is her grandfather who she remembered when she were a really little girl before he was sent to fight, was a handsome, you know, sort of man. And because of the conscription, he was actually too old to fight in 1944 when he was sent over there. But uh, Germany was so desperate, they were, they were called the Volkstrom, where they were, um, you know, just anyone of, up to the fucking in Berlin, there were 70 year old men fighting and 12 year old boys. You know, the, um, Hein, uh, what's his name, Joseph Goebbels and uh, Heinrich Kimmler and that, they lowered the age down to 12 years old. Basically, if you were able-bodied, you fought. 
and she says um, she'll never forget it. One of those like things that you never ever forget. She said um, the war was over. They knew that Germany had lost and surrendered, so everyone was scared. They didn't know what was going to happen. They were terrified of the Russians on the east who were coming in because fucking <laughs> they were absolutely especially if you were a woman or a child because um the the red army the soldiers were absolutely brutal with german women the mass rapes that went on was just absolutely it's it's unbelievable um horrifying what happened all german women were terrified of what was going to happen to them on the east and they were also scared of the americans and the british because you know um, what were we going to do to them you know, again, it's not sympathising too much, but I do empathise. You know, they were scared. And she said that there were these disband... Because the armies had been disbanded, because Germany had um, surrendered, there were all these men who'd made it back from the Eastern Front, and they basically walked back from, um, like, what's modern-day Ukraine and everything now. They walked back to Germany from there. And she said, I'll never forget it were, I can't remember she said it were late one night or early one morning. There were these strange men coming, like sounds outside the house, down the street. They could hear men and, it, you know, all the men had been sent to the front. So it was her and her mother, like all women living together. And they could hear men on the street and they were terrified thinking, is it the Russians? And she said it were, um, there was a, not even a knock at the door, the door like went, like it's, it's hinges and it and they came downstairs and she said this man was stood there and he had a massive beard and he's and he stank you know he, he, he stank you know like that smell of like a tramp lamp washed and he had his long military coat on and boots and his eyes looked like um uh, renata said to me i'll never forget his eyes she said they were like it was my granddad but his eyes were like animalistic and he said woman food 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 like that and he started raiding all cupboards and um and he and, and sat down and you know they all thought that he were dead and he and he's like saying um food 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 like that and he just and he just ate this tin of food like that and he ate another tin and she were making him coffee and then these other men were trying to come in and he ended up fighting with men to get him out you know like saying this is my fucking house kind of thing and she said it was terrifying because it was my granddad, but it wasn't him because he'd been psychologically damaged by what had happened on Eastern Front and he was starving and he'd been made by his unit to walk back. They all, they all, you know, your commanding officers, they all had cars and stuff and they just went, right, we've surrendered. Oh, fuck you lot, make your own way back. And they made him walk back from Russia. Not all of them, but a lot of them. You know, the whole country were in just like... Um, it was destruction and chaos as well and so he'd walked back from modern day Ukraine and um, like she said she was only a little girl but she said it's like all his humanity had gone and he was just starving like an animal you know he didn't want even like you know saying hello to him he was like fooled and then eventually he got some food in his belly and he was alright and he went and had a bath and she said the bath was black. <laughs> the water was fucking black. But the thing is, it's there, it's important. Keep yourself clean, keep yourself, you know, eat and stuff like that if you can. Don't lose your humanity because it will make you into a monster. She, but she said I thought it was a monster. She said it, it was this man with a massive beard and like these red eyes she said his eyes were like animal eyes and she said i knew it was my granddad but i was scared of him because he was starving and he was scared you know if they'd have got caught by Ru russians they'd have been disemboweled and hung you know they, all the german soldiers were terrified of getting captured by russians because they knew what was coming to them because how did they treat the russian villages when they was invading you see jesus was right wasn't he treat other people as you want to be treated because when the tables are turned you know you reap what you sow don't you he had a right to be scared didn't he <laughs> that's how it works folks that's how the, the fucking world if you treat people like shit when you're on top what happens when the tables are turned it's obvious isn't it it's very hard to break the chain 
Yeah, and the other one is, first one is turn the other cheek. The second one is about the tunic. And the third one is, well, there's many things that it says about the Pharisees, but uh, about cleaning the inside of your bowl and not just the outside of your bowl. What's all that about? Whitewashed tombs and all that lot. You're concerned with superficial things and uh, you're rotten and stinking and disgusting on the inside. Walk the extra mile. And this is another thing that was specific for the time. Um, any Roman citizen, uh, it was probably more for the Roman legionnaire, the soldier. What they could do is, any, I think they could actually, I'm not sure, I need to look this up, I can't remember what this guy was saying, whether it means that a Roman soldier could make a Roman citizen do this. I don't think a Roman, they'd let, I don't think they could let a, I don't think they were allowed to treat a Roman citizen this way, but a subject they were. A Roman soldier, if he saw you at the side of the road and he was tired, he could go, right, all my gear here, you're carrying it for me. You've become his servant. So say you've got to walk, I don't know, say you've got a couple of miles to go before you get into the nearest village or whatever and you see a, a peasant who's working in the field, you could go up to that peasant no matter what he was doing and you could say, hey buddy, you're not tilling the land anymore. Here, carry all my shit, right, and follow me and do what I say and you're carrying it. You could do that and they did do that. If the law says that you can do it, people will, fo they will. <laughs> you know, that's what Jesus says. Be careful of people who, who constantly abide by the law because the dangerous people you know if the government in this country said that you can go and behead all far-right extremists there'd be lots of beheadings wouldn't there you know what i mean <laughs> the government in germany said uh, all jews exterminate them loads of people did exterminate jews you know you've got to be careful just because something's legal or illegal today doesn't mean that it's going to be legal or illegal tomorrow so you it's god's laws you know i understand that's why Jesus is always saying to him, you followers of the law, you're boring. You, you worship the law of the land and law of men. You know, what about God's law, the law of nature and things like that? Yeah, the other one is that Jesus says, if somebody forces you to carry all of their stuff for a mile, at the end of that mile, you know, because he's ordered you to do it and it's actually written in law that you have to do it or you can be persecuted, you can be um, in a lot of trouble for it. He says, um, offer that person, say, hey buddy, I'll go the next mile with you. You know, I've just done it a mile, that's all that I'm legally, like, um, that's what I have to do. Uh, you know, the, by law you had to do it for a, at least a mile and um, Jesus says, go the extra mile. Say, look at him right in the face at the, the moment where he's saying, right, you don't need to help me now. Look at him and say, no, no, you've just made me do that. I'll do this for you now. I'll carry your stuff. Come on, we're not that far from village. Uh, yeah, you've just made me walk. You've made my, my, you've made me leave my wife and kids in the field, right? And you've just taken me away from what I was doing to help you because Caesar tells me I've got to. Let's go all the way, you know, so come on, buddy. That's what, that's what it's about. <laughs> He might look at you and think, are you crazy? But crazy in your world, Jesus says, always rise above. Never allow them to look down on you. And it's not about us up there looking down on them, but in a way it is. I don't know if that's the right way to say it. I don't want to be like blaspheming or anything, but it's not about looking down on people. It's, it's extra dimensional it, it, that's as simple as it gets it's it, it's forcing them to treat you like a human being because you're going to treat them like a human being you're going to see them as more than just a persecutor who you're supposed to hit because it'd be easy to hate that hate that person wouldn't it rise above it love that person 
see the humanity in them, force them to feel shame and guilt. Not all of them will, but word gets around. People gossip, don't they? And, and if they find out that um, you're that Roman soldier who's, um, you know, just been spoken to like that, it'll cause you to feel sort of like, whoa, yeah, I am a bit of a knobhead. It might make you really angry and embarrassed. People might be laughing at you behind your back. Look at the way that that Christian treat you. Might make you hate Christians. Again, it falls into what Jesus unfortunately says. You're going to cause people to hate you. Not all people. And the people who do hate you for doing that, they're not worth it anyway. They're just garbage anyway. But at least you sh showed them that you're not someone who's... You're not a piece of garbage, you're a human being. Now I've just got another letter from Germany. A massive court document again and I'm just sick of it now with my ex, but like I say, kind of pity her in a way, really. I don't know if it's from her or just the courts giving a transcript to what happened when we went to court last month. Or, I'm just sick of hearing about it now, but I'm, I don't let it get to me. Because I've done, I've done the hardest thing ever. I've, 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 I've done it. I'm changed now. I don't see it in that way. I'm not angry about it. I'm just, it's just sad, really. And um, I, I understand what Jesus says now. Pray for your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. I pray for my ex, and I genuinely mean that as well. I'm not being sarcastic. I pray for her because if she's still harbouring all this hatred towards me, it's gonna deform her. It's gonna deform her like it's gonna make her ill. Uh, in a way, like it's pity in her, really. Yeah, you know, I did love her. You know, she was like one of my best friends, really. really. She was my best friend. We moved together. And that's the way that I feel now, and it's taken a long time, but I understand, and it's Jesus' teachings who's, who's helped me do that. I, I sort of... Well, what does he say? If I'm just using my ex as an example, because I don't have many people wanting to persecute me, I don't have many enemies, I don't have any enemies, really, really. I don't know, maybe I do, maybe I don't. I, I don't really... Don't really hang around with many people now, you know, try to limit it. And when people do treat me a certain way, I just don't, don't have anything to do with them. Do you know what I mean? I don't need people anymore. I don't. If I'm if I'm spending time with people now, it means that um, the people who I want to, my time's in vel uh, very precious to me now. I'm not someone who's a needy person now. I don't need to be around people. I'm perfectly happy with my own company. And then if I'm with someone else, you know, it means that I want to be with them, you know what I mean? It, um, I, but I don't need to be with them. That's a different thing. I'm not needy anymore. And when someone is persistently treating me like like my ex has been doing, there's always something. I mean, it's quietened off a bit now, but I've just got another letter. Do you know what I mean? Like, what the fuck? What is it now? But I'm just sort of like... I understand now, Jesus says, love your enemy, bless them that curse you, that put curses on you, do good to those that hate you, pray for those that despise you and persecute you. It's not like a sarcastic thing or a weak thing where I'm going, oh Lord, please, you know, help my ex, or, or, or please help her, I'm scared of her, I'm not scared of her anymore. I'm not scared of her. I've never, never have been scared of my ex. I think she's pathetic. But it was hurting me the things that she were doing, that that that, that using the law against me and all that lot, and it was hurting me. It was destroying me. I was allowing it to destroy me. And now I understand what God says. You know, pray. I pray that she can one day, and I'm not, being, I'm not being facetious at all, I pray that one day she can see the things that I've seen. I mean, I really do. Peace and serenity, I pray for her, I hope that she can. I, pr I really mean it as well. 
you know, just to be able to see, you know, I am the light, Jesus, I am the light. He who follows me shall never walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. You know, I wish that everyone could, could, could experience that. But I know what I had to do to do it, so I don't really care, do you know what I mean? I'm not really that bothered. It's just nice when you meet other people who've had the same experience, you know, it's awesome. I know what they mean. And it's awesome. And I don't really care if anyone has it or not. I mean, it doesn't make no difference to me. It'd be nice. But I know how hard it was for me. And I know how hard it was. Like Jesus says, it will be hard. It'll be impossible for some people. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is to find the kingdom of heaven on earth. My boy, do I know what that means? I do. I, I don't think I, if I, I, I was destined never to get it. But miracles, you know. Got to hold on to it as well. It's all these things, you know. That it's a continual thing every day. It's really hard, hardest thing that I'll ever do. But it's better than the alternative. So uh, yeah, once again, JC, misinterpretation by me or um, misunderstanding, so I sort of get it now. And we don't live in that world now where it's customary for authority figures to be able to do that with the back of the hand, but they do it in other ways. Remember, he's giving a guideline for all time. People will have other ways of, of backhanding you across the face and you'll have other ways of demonstrating to them it's about, it's a riddle and a secret that all of us will know in our relationships and our, um, the way we are on other people. It's knowing how to make them, force them to see your humanity. And obviously everyone's different, aren't they? But if you've got someone who's doing that psychological warfare to you, find a way. It's not about payback and karma. I hate that word, karma. It's dark magic, man. Don't ever wish karma on anyone. Karma, it exists, it does. It's not good. It is like that, though, because it's true. Karma's true, it's magic, but it's dark. It's very dark. Don't ever wish, because it's a curse. Never curse other people. Don't put curses and spells on people because it exists. Don't curse yourself. Because I used to curse myself all the time. Don't ever talk low about yourself because that's a curse. And it's real. It's dark magic. It works. That's what cursing is. And I'm not going to curse other people as well. I'm not going to wish bad on them because it'll come true. Because it could do. And, it, and, it, and it's bad and it's toxic and it's creating mischief. It's creating trouble and mischief and darkness in God's world and he don't like it either. And he will punish those who do it. So I'm not doing that anymore. I'm not cursing other people anymore. I mean like, you know, I mean, I'm not wishing bad dark energy on anyone because it's not good. Because what goes around comes around. So that's just a little bit of warning to anyone. I mean, you do what you want with your life, but that's stuff that everyone's, because everyone laughs at Christianity and stuff. Chris, Jesus is the master of the spirit world. He is. He's God. He's, he's, he created the whole fucking thing. Spells and dark magic is real and it's everywhere. You know, people all use the word karma, bad karma. It's black magic and it works. If you wish bad karma on someone, you're a bad person. That's dark. And what goes around comes around. You know, and I'm saying that for me, you know, I've wished badness on people and it's not good. Um, somehow I've been able to break that chain. And, uh, I don't know, just, just one of those things. But it says... Love your enemy. Bless them that curse you. 
do good to those that hate you. Do good to those that hate you and pray for those that despise you and persecute you. So yeah, another day and another understanding for me or learning about Jesus' teachings and being able to see it in a way that I can put it into practice. And it's different, you know, like, and uh, I guess it's about knowing it's just finding a way and it's uh, just any way that's possible of, of forcing someone or a situation where you've been treated a certain way to make them see you as a human being they'll, they'll have to do it I mean they, they will want to do it but they'll have to it'll force you it'll force them to see you they'll have to see you as a human being because that's what they've tried to do they're not treating you like a human force them to, to see your humanity. Yeah, over and out. Uh, awesome. JC comes to the rescue once again. JC wins again. But like, uh, it's like what's impulse, isn't it though? We're here to win, not punch the air, right? Yeah, it's like, yeah, another victory, punch in the air. It's like, no, 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 no. Humble yourself. We're here for the long run. It's going to be a hard run. There will be people who are going to persecute you. You will find more enemies unless you just stay at home on your own all the time, right? You have to get out there and live. <laughs> you know, it's just about fighting with different tools this time. Over and out. JC wins. He doesn't punch the air. No, far from it. He is the air. He controls. He created the air. Over and out.